I don't know if you've noticed, but nostalgia has kind of been a big selling point recently. With sequels and remakes coming out for old films, TV shows, books, and even video games that seem to draw a lot of attention because they involve content that many of us grew up with. Fuller House, any of the Disney live-action remakes, Spyro the Reignited trilogy, you get the idea. Many of these reboots or sequels tend to be a bit subpar compared to the original source material, either trying too hard to replicate the original or making too many changes that make it completely unrecognizable and devoid of what made it beloved to begin with. Well, except for Spyro, that was pretty good. Oh, and it Chapter 1, to be frank, turned out way better than any right to be. Chapter 2, eh. But every once in a while, you find a rare reimagining that not only transcends the original source material, but uses the iconography of the original and builds off the bare essentials. It does so in such an unexpected way to tell a story that's truly special. Well, we're here to talk about one such story today that comes from an extremely unlikely source, Hanna-Barbera Snagglepuss. For those who don't remember, or too young to have grown up on the character, Snagglepuss is a cartoon character created in 1959 by Hanna-Barbera Productions. He originally premiered as an orange-furred cougar named Snaggletooth in the quick drama Gross show, before getting his own cartoon in 1961. This is when he was given his traditional collar and cuffs. He was largely inspired by the cowardly lion from Wizard of Oz, so much so that Bert Lahr, the actor who played said lion, actually sued Hanna-Barbera because their voices sounded too much alike and he didn't want people to get them confused. Snagglepuss largely existed to sound kind of funny and shout off some catchphrases. One of which being, Exit! Stage right! Exit! Stage left! He's a character that, despite being under the Hanna-Barbera banner, has remained largely in obscurity. That is, until early 2018, when DC Comics decided to completely reinvent the character for the modern age with their book, Exit Stage Left, The Snagglepuss Chronicles written by Mark Russell, who also wrote a similar reimagining of the Flintstones. In the Snagglepuss Chronicles, Snagglepuss is a famous New York playwright living in the early 50s of McCarthyism, where he is being actively targeted by the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Despite living in a world that is currently ruled by paranoia, fear-mongering, and indulging in all the ugliness that brings out in us, Snagglepuss actually seems like a bright spot in these dark times. His plays are designed to inspire and provoke, his quick wit and charm make him beloved by the public, He's known to give people unexpected chances, and in some cases second chances, and he's willing to speak his own truth, even if it's not what people want to hear. I suppose you can say that, at heart, he's a jaded optimist. He writes and talks about what he believes in and what he would like people to see and believe in themselves. Although, despite good intentions, he has no illusions that they will either listen or care. But he still does it because, in his mind, somebody has to. He says as much in the beginning of the book, which of course means it's officially time for the deep dive, so let's set the stage. Our story starts with Snagglepuss being interrogated at a hearing where the members of the committee try to get him to give names of anyone that might quote-unquote threaten our way of life. After basically humiliating everyone on the committee, Snagglepuss is met outside of the courthouse by a young writer named Augie, who sees Snagglepuss as an inspiration and wants to change the world. Snagglepuss sits him down and tells him the story of his early days in theater as a clown for comedy plays. They weren't deep or complex or anything like that. They were simple plays for simple people who, in Snagglepuss's words, try to convince themselves they're having a good time. But when a fire breaks out backstage, he rushes to the stage in full clown regalia and tries to warn the audience. But everyone just keeps laughing, thinking it's part of the show. They laugh and laugh right up to the point where the entire audience is caught in the flame. He relates that story to Augie as a metaphor to the world, that it's truly on fire, that it's a writer's job to try to warn them. But don't do so with the assumption that any of them will listen, because, again, people just want to have a good time. When Augie responds, well, then what's the point of any of this? Why write at all? Snagapus replies, you do not fight battles because you expect to win. You fight them merely because they need to be fought. While that statement can really be applied to any number of social or political issues that was plaguing the nation or the world at the time, the battle that Snagglepuss chooses to fight is a much more personal one. The fight against ingrained cultural standards. Unfortunately, the same standards that Snagglepuss wants to change are the ones that the Committee of Un-American Activities want to maintain. You see, while the world sees Snagglepuss as a rich, heterosexual man or cougar, he is actually a closet homosexual and is forced to keep that huge part of his life under careful lock and key. At the beginning of the story, 
Snagopus has, by and large, accepted that his sexuality must be kept secret, but has found ways to express his emotional, romantic, and sexual needs without drawing the attention of the public eye. He does so by frequently visiting the only gay bar in New York called The Stonewall, where he meets up with his boyfriend Pablo. He also manages to maintain his public image through his marriage with actress Leela Lyon, who is fully aware that the marriage is a sham. Snagopus works hard to maintain his social and personal life, so he can continue to write and produce his plays without losing the security of either, even as more and more of his friends and colleagues are ruined and blacklisted as a result of the committee. He tries to keep his head down and doesn't talk about politics, but also won't play along with anything he doesn't agree with either. Unfortunately, while this makes him popular with his fans, it also draws the attention of Gigi Allen, a member of the committee who wants to take Snagopus down or turn to their side to convince others in show business to come forward. The hope is that anyone Snagopus inspires will give them the names of anyone that might, in their minds, poison the American culture. Which is, of course, simply code for anyone that isn't a blindly loyal straight American patriot. Gigi spends the majority of the book trying to find leverage on Snagopus to either convert or destroy him. While she fails at getting any dirt in him directly, she does find leverage in the form of one of the story's other central characters, Huckleberry Hound. In the Snagopus Chronicles, Huckleberry is reimagined as a severely depressed ex-writer and best friend to Snagopus. He was chased out of his hometown by the police for being homosexual, leaving his wife and son behind. Huck tries to go back to New York and reconnect with Snagopus, hoping that he can help him restart his life, while also finding love and meaning along the way. For a time, he actually does! He finds refuge in the stone wall where he falls in love with Officer McGraw, but Gigi's vendetta against Nygopus leads to a police raid on the stone wall, during which time Huck is horribly beaten and arrested. While not quite the dirt she was looking for, this unexpected arrest gives Gigi the leverage she needs. After learning of the arrest, Snagopus quickly rushes over to pick Huck up from the station, and it's during this time, in the lowest point of his life, that Huck challenges Snagopus on his core beliefs by saying simply this. The truth is, they will always find us. Whatever we do, wherever we hide, they'll find us. We're fools if we think otherwise. Our only choice in life is to change the world or be destroyed by it. Stankopus says at the beginning of the book that you do not fight battles because you expect to win. You fight them merely because they need to be fought. But now Huck is saying they have to fight to win or else it will never end. The world will swallow them whole. Shortly after being publicly exposed, Huckleberry Hound commits suicide in his apartment. Meanwhile, Snagopus prepares to face another hearing from the committee, which is to be televised throughout America. It is here where he is forced to decide whether he will play ball with the committee and save his friends and family, or stand for what he believes in and defy them at the cost of his reputation, career, and livelihood. It isn't until he hears the news of Huck's tragic fate that his decision becomes clear. At the hearing, Snagopus protests the committee's very notion that quote-unquote subversion, which they're defying as activity they find wrong, needs to be put to an end, along with anyone that would engage in it. He argues instead that subversion is not only necessary to the nation, but also the very purpose of art itself. Subversion makes culture what it is. It forces the world to look at things in a new way. It shows people that the world needs to change. Through art and the act of subversion, the American people are given a place to direct their passion and fanaticism, as well as give the performers a chance to air their grievances. Or, as Nygopus puts it, art is telling the world how it's killing you, how its institutions have failed you. He closes his appeal to the committee and to the American people with his own views on what it is to live in LGBTQ community, and instead of paraphrasing, I'm just going to read directly. You want us to keep ourselves discreetly out of view, not so that we will live in secret, but that we might die there. People can only live in shame for so long. Shame is the barrier we erect to keep people from discovering what's extraordinary about themselves, to keep people from discovering what they have to offer the world and the rest of us from benefiting from it. To live in shame is to wear a mask. Eventually, we become the mask we have chosen. There is no greater tragedy in life than to die a stranger to yourself. Conformity and shame destroy people, and a culture that doesn't fight back is as useful as an old calendar. We enter and leave this world alone. So during the gloriously brief sigh in between, 
we must live our lives the way we want to, whatever the consequences. So there it is. With one sweeping speech, Snagapus spoke his truth. He tried to warn a world on fire. And what was the result? Did the American people stand tall and proud that day, cheering for their hero? Were cultural standards changed overnight? Did people learn the error of their ways and unite the nation in one fell swoop? No. Snagapus doesn't get a happy ending. He loses his job, gets blacklisted from show business, is deemed a communist by the public, and left in a sad little house eating TV dinners. But just because he didn't change the heart of everyone through one epic speech doesn't mean people didn't listen. This is revealed to him by the bartender at Stonewall, who tells him that because of his example, more gay bars started to open up. People were starting to take bigger risks to slowly change the cultural landscape. Or as the bartender puts it, you didn't fight the system to win, SP. You fought to show it can be done. Snykopos may not have won the cultural war he was fighting, but he gave courage for others to take up the fight for themselves, to no longer live in shame and behind masks, to fight for the right to be able to walk through the streets without fear of condemnation or assault, to fight for the right to be, because, as the bartender puts it, they're not going anywhere. And that's the point, isn't it? Snykopos was right and wrong. You can't fight the battle with the expectation to win, but you can hope that at least some will listen and do something to fight too. A common theme throughout the book is the theme of complacency and how hard society will fight to maintain that complacency. In this context, the world was content to believe that anything outside the normal should simply be removed as if it was a tumor or a blight. They wanted the problem of LGBTQ people removed. And if it can't be removed, kept so hidden as to not be in any way expressed, noticed, or acknowledged to the outside world. Hell, even Gigi is revealed to be a lesbian towards the book's climax, showing that she didn't truly hate LGBTQ people, she just wanted them to keep it private. And by keeping it private, society at large can maintain this idea of a perfect America, where everyone is exactly the American ideal, proud of their nation, and never questioning their country or holding it accountable. The government knows what's best for us, and we should just all accept that. But as the Snagopus Chronicles shows, Complacency is death. Without the ability or will to stand up against the actions of her own nation, without the will to stand up to society's attempt to bully people into submission, to let the world force everyone to conformity, we will never grow as a nation or as a people. Because perfection is a lie. And to believe we can find some kind of utopia by having everyone think and feel the same is to deny the world the beauty that subversion has to offer and the truths that such subversions can reveal. Namely, the unspoken commonality we all have with each other, no matter what race, sexuality, or gender. But to tell that truth and give others the courage to do the same usually requires someone to enter the world stage and take that first step to start the culture revolution. But those who do so very rarely get the happy ending. In Snagopus's case, his defiant message to the committee cost him his life as he knew it. While he believed it was the right thing to do, and he did eventually recover, he still had to sacrifice the carefully balanced life he worked so hard for to give others a chance. Think back to any major cultural revolutionary that you've learned about in school. Abraham Lincoln, assassinated in the theater. Martin Luther King, shot in a motel. Gandhi, killed by a Hindu nationalist. Mandela, spent 27 years in prison. Harvey Milk, shot by Dan White in 1978. All paid a price for their actions. But what they did shaped the world for the better, in ways that go beyond imagining, in a way that was impossible without them. If these people didn't enter the world stage and made their stances known, we would still be living in a state of heavily imposed complacency. Now, I'm not saying that every person who makes a huge cultural difference will suffer a grisly fade or pay a heavy toll for standing up, nor am I saying that all civil rights leaders and historical figures are forever ruined by their actions. The people I listed are only a small sampling of the many influential civil rights advocates who changed the world. What I am saying is that with any threat to the cultural standing, there's going to be a risk for those looking to subvert those standards. But it needs to be done. It needs to be done so we can continue to go forward, not back. It needs to be done not so everyone can think and feel the same, but so we can all be free to think and act differently without fear. To think and act in a way that celebrates our differences rather than demonizes them. 
and maybe, just maybe, the person to start the next cultural shift will be you. Will you be ready for that? I hope so, because if there's one thing I've learned from the Psychopus Chronicles, is that before you exit stage left, you need to enter stage right. <laughs>